Good morning, church. It's so good to see all of you here this morning. I just ask that you please stand up as we get some time to praise our Lord Jesus Christ in worship. On a hill of sinners, His body broken, a King forsaken, as He hung on that cross. The veil in pieces, the temple shaken, they mourn the Saviour, but it wasn't for long.
Hey guys, welcome to church. My name is Michael, and this is my little brother, Emmanuel. What do you mean little, bro? I'm literally your older brother. I said little brother, not younger brother. Anyways, <laughs> today we're doing a youth takeover, so it's gonna be a special service. We have the youth running, as you can see, and yeah. Um, yeah, so off the back of that, I'd like to take the opportunity to officially welcome you to Kellyville Church. Uh, on this wonderful Sabbath and a special welcome to our online visitors as well. Um, so today we have a special sermon because as he said, we have, my, as my, my little brother said, we have um, the youth service. So we actually have not one, not two, but three individuals from our youth uh, pre- speaking today about John 11 and Jesus as the re- resurrection of life. So sit back and enjoy because there's no wahala in the house of the Lord. And so if you would please turn your attention to the screen for the giving portion of today's service and the ways to give will be on the screen. If you could make a difference in someone's life by giving something up for one week, what would you give up? Some 100 years ago in 1922, Seventh-day Adventists did exactly that. The money used to support missionaries was running out. When the church was nearly forced to call its missionaries home, Adventists stepped up. They accepted the challenge of the mission offering. They gave up something for mission. Children gave their piggy bank savings. Adults gave a week's wages. By giving something up, they kept the missionaries in the field. By giving something up, they kept the church's mission program on track. The annual sacrifice offering helps global missions start new groups of believers among unreached people, often in the most challenging places in the world. So challenging, in fact, that Global Mission identifies some of these places only as veiled cities or veiled countries. We do not publicly name these places. Today, there are still more than 7,000 unreached people groups with a total of more than 3 billion people. Jesus told the parable of the lost sheep. When one sheep was missing, the shepherd went out to search for it. We are told that when Jesus looked at the crowds, he looked at them with compassion because they were like sheep without a shepherd. Today, he still looks at the crowds with compassion. How about us? Can we look out with the same compassion? So what would you give up? That snack from the vending machine, that drink you love, a pizza, those new shoes, that new game, your favorite candy bar, that new toy, that slice of cake, hot chocolate or cold chocolate, those in-app purchases, that nearly irresistible deal of the day. Now, here's the challenge. Let's actually do it. Give up one thing for one week. Challenge your friends and family and give the money to the annual sacrifice offering. You can give online or in church. Simply mark your tithe envelope, annual sacrifice offering. Good morning, church. Um, we've been chosen to do the prayer today, so can I get everyone to bow their heads, please? Dear God, we gather before you today grateful for the gift of community and the opportunity to worship together. In this moment, we bring before you the various challenges and joys to mark our lives. We lift up those among us who are facing difficult times. Grant them strength, comfort, and guidance. In the midst of their struggles, May they find hope in your promises. We hold on to the words of Jesus who declared, I am the resurrection and the life. Through him, we find assurance in the hope of eternal life. As we navigate the complexities of our daily lives, we seek your wisdom to follow the example set by Jesus. May our actions reflect love, compassion and selflessness just as he demonstrated during his time on earth. Lord, strengthen the bonds of our community. Help us to support one another, to be understanding in times of trial and to celebrate um, together in times of joy. May our collective presence be a beacon of your light in this world. As we spend this time in worship, may it be a genuine expression of our love for you and for each other. Guide us in living lives that honor and glorify you. We offer this prayer in Jesus' name. I pray, amen. 
Let's continue to worship. Let's stand on our feet. This one might be a fairly new song to some of you. So if you know it, follow along and sing with us. If you don't, follow along and learn with us. All right, here we go. Christ is my firm foundation.
Good morning, church. Good morning. We have been uh, lately thanking some of our leaders, and especially those people who faithfully serve. Maybe they have been serving for a number of years, and they are rarely or almost never up here on the stage. And this morning, we want to give a special huge thank you to our church clerk, Julie Marsden. Thank you. Did you hear what you said? <laughs> yeah, there's flowers for you. Now, a lot of people sitting here, Julie, have no idea what the church clerk does. Uh, you have, anybody knows? <laughs> Uh, she is keeping our church records, our membership records. If you want to be a part of our church, you will have to do with, deal with Julie. Uh, as she is also preparing our church uh, board meetings and business meetings. And, and believe it or not, she's also serving coffee. So uh, thank you, Julie. You've been uh, uh, serving in this function for many, many years, I don't dare to say it, and uh, I know you'll double it. <laughs> uh, we just want to thank you, and we just want to pray for you and your family and your kids and grandkids. Let's just pray together, church. Heavenly Father, we are um, honored to be part of your family and honored to be part of your church, and there are, we are surrounded by faithful people who are serving, who are... Um, <clears throat> Not really up front, but they are in the quiet, serving and helping. And Julie's one of those. And Wayne as well. And we just pray a prayer of blessing over them, over their kids, over their grandkids. We pray, Lord, that uh, as they show this service example to us, that we will pick up. And that we will also be willingly, lovingly serving other people. Uh, thank you for them. It's been uh, such a blessing to have them as part of our church family. And, and we just pray a prayer of blessing over them. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Jill. Thank you, Martin. As, um, as Emmanuel's little brother said before, oh no, Michael's little brother said before, um, it's, a, it's a youth service today. And so we thought to ourselves as a pastoral team, you're probably sick of Martin and I preaching at the front. And so we've actually asked three of our youth at church. And so we've got Kiara Tyler from Switch. We've got Hannah Hill from our young adults. And we've got Hannah Kent from our young professionals. And they're gonna be sharing the word today around the idea of Jesus being the resurrection and the life. And so to set us uh, in the mood, I wanna invite Bella up. She's gonna read a piece of scripture to help us get ready for for the sermons ahead. Thank you, Bella. So John eleven twenty five 25 to 26 says, Jesus told her, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. Everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this, Martha? Good morning, church. Today we are continuing the theme, The King Is, and we are looking at the idea that the King is the resurrection and the life. Let's have a look at the book of John, chapter 11. Up until this chapter, Jesus has been performing many signs and miracles. Each of these signs has helped Jesus to make claims about who he is and reveal to the people something about him. He has turned water into wine, fed the 5,000, and done many more signs. These have helped him share with the people claims like, I am the bread of life and I am the living water, many of which have made the religious leaders of the time very angry. The last claim that Jesus makes is that he and the Father are one. This claim makes the religious leaders particularly angry and they begin to plot to kill him. Jesus decides to leave and go back across the Jordan River to a place called Bethabara, which is where he is when he hears the news about Lazarus. John 11, verse 1 and 3 says, Now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. 
When Jesus hears of this, he says, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. And Jesus decides to stay where he was for two more days. To me, that seems so weird. Like, why would Jesus stay where he was when his friend who he loves is sick? If I heard that my close friend or family was sick, I would be there as quick as I could. So why would Jesus not leave as soon as he got word? Well, when we think about it, Jesus was far away from where Lazarus was. And in those times, it would have been almost a whole day's travel. So by the time word even got to Jesus, Lazarus was probably already dead and buried. So even if Jesus had left straight away, he would have been about two days late. But still, if he really loved Lazarus, wouldn't he do all that he could to get there in time? But as Jesus had said, Lazarus' sickness was not going to end in death, and it was for God's glory so that God's Son may be glorified through it. So there must be a reason that Jesus stayed. If you look at Jewish customs, they believed that the soul of a person stayed with them for three days before ascending back to God. After these three days, the body would begin decaying. So if Jesus had left straight away and arrived within those three days, then the Jews would not have believed that Lazarus coming back to life was a miracle at all. They would have just thought that Lazarus' spirit or soul had returned to the body in enough time. However, because Jesus waited and arrived four days after Lazarus was dead, his body would have started decaying. This meant that Jesus' authority and power over death was revealed in a much more meaningful and miraculous way to those that were there. This authority and power that Jesus obviously had over death, which he had now revealed, only made the religious leaders of the time even more determined to kill him. So, because Jesus raised Lazarus and saved his life, ultimately, it is what cost Jesus his. It is all well and good, though, that Jesus would do that for Lazarus. But what does this mean for us today? Well, if you think about what Jesus did for Lazarus, it is somewhat of a symbol for us today. It shows us that Jesus loves us and would lay down his life for us. But not only that, but he also showed us that he has power over all circumstances and authority over everything, including death. Jesus called Lazarus out of his tomb, out of the thing that he was buried under and into new life with him. Just like Jesus calls us out of our sins and circumstances that we are buried under, which are symbolized by our tomb. Jesus calls us out of that and into new life with him, which is why the symbolism of resurrection and life is so important. It is also why we get baptized. When I was researching for this sermon, the only thing that came to mind was this song. The song is called Rise Up by the music group Cain and is about Jesus calling Lazarus out of his tomb. However, once you get to the chorus, it says, come on and rise up, take a breath, you're alive now. Can't you hear the voice of Jesus calling us out from the grave like Lazarus? To me, this chorus was about how Jesus not only called Lazarus, but also calls me into new life with him. This realization that Jesus is calling me out of my sins and struggles has helped me so much. Not only that, but having peace in knowing that Jesus has full control over it fills me with so much comfort. Now when I face hardship or sin, when I find myself feeling buried underneath it, I remember that Jesus told us through this story that he has full control over it. And I think once we realize that although we go through these things that seem to bury us, whatever it is, whether it is pride, anger, anxiety or stress, Jesus is calling us out of that. The story of Lazarus just reminds me that Jesus has power over all things in life, which means that I can live my life in peace, knowing that Jesus has conquered it and now calls me out of it too. Thank you. Thanks, Kiara. Um, as Josh said, I'm one of the two Hannahs talking today. Um, and yeah. We'll take another look at this passage. But um, I don't know if any of you remember the Martha we met in Luke chapter 10. 
Um, she was the sister that was, had the gift of hospitality. She was the one who welcomed Jesus into her home and set about preparing a really big dinner with attention to all the small details. So much so that she lost sight of who she had in her house in the midst of trying to make everything perfect. She morphs from the perfect host to resentful martyr. Um, having a bit of a tantrum about how her sister is not helping her out. I don't know about you, but that's, that's pretty relatable. I'd like to shout out to my brother for all of his hard work in the house chores every week. Um, but surprisingly, instead of Jesus siding with her, he takes her to task about it. He doesn't just let it slide and excusing her on the grounds of good intention. He says in verse 41, Martha, you are worried and upset over all these details. There is one thing worth being concerned about. Mary has discovered it. That's a bit of a reprimand. How would you have felt if you'd received that correction from Jesus and been compared to your sibling in the same sentence? It's a bit rough. Um, but for those of you who don't know, um, I'm studying physiotherapy and I'm on my last clinical placement in the very niche and meticulous sect of um, hand therapy. And this week has felt like a week of reprimands. Everything I did could have been done better. My note formatting was all wrong. Um, my splints had too many sketch marks left on them. So if you squint really hard, you can see there's a little bit of yellow right there. Um, then just the list went on. After receiving correction after correction, I was a bit like, far out, can I just chuck a sickie? Because it, it's hard to take correction. I don't know if Martha felt like this in the moment, because by the time we meet her again in John chapter 11, um, she's really grown in her faith, and she's able to see the bigger picture and has taken on Jesus' correction. So if we look at John chapter 11, verse 20, it is Martha who goes out to meet Jesus and declare that if he had been there, her brother would not have died. In verse 22, she says, even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask. She's declaring that she knows Jesus has the power to perform a miracle and bring her brother back from the dead. In verse 23, Jesus replies, your brother will rise again. Yes, Martha said, he will rise when everyone else rises at the last day. Now here's the paradigm shift. In verse 26, um, 25 to 26, Jesus says, you don't have to wait for the end. I am right now resurrection and life. The one who believes in me, though he or she dies, will live. Anyone who lives believing in me does not ultimately die at all. At all. Martha, the one who Jesus chastised for not getting the bigger picture, for majoring on the minors, in verse 27 says, Yes, Master, all along I have believed that you are the Messiah, the Son of God. Martha demonstrates great faith in the fact that Jesus has the power to change the here and now, as well as having power over eternity, and that it's not one or the other, but that it's both simultaneously. She also recognises that it's not her role to define when and how Jesus shows up. How good is it that Martha, who was initially focused on doing and doing as a perfectionist, now sees the bigger picture and declares her faith? That's, that's a lot of growth. And how encouraging is that to us, that we can start off not really paying attention to the right detail, but yet if we're willing to let Jesus correct us, we can grow and let him change our focus. Martha calls Jesus the Messiah, which means saviour. And there's a Greek word for that. Uh, it's called soteria, which translated back into English has two meanings. Um, the first is to be saved from the enemy, and the second is to be saved for eternity. This helps us to understand what Jesus means in verse 26 when he says, everyone who lives believing in me does not ultimately die at all. It's a bit hard for our human heads to understand. We think of time as lineal, but Jesus' time, it's eternal. Uh, when we make that leap of faith and begin a relationship with Jesus, it's outside our normal appreciation of time. We have precious life right now to do good things, but we also have life eternal beyond the death that comes to us as humans. When we're faced with tough things, remember that we have a God who has conquered death and is greater than all our concern of lineal time.
Thanks so much, Kiara and Hannah. Good morning, everyone. It's so great to be here on this absolutely beautiful Sabbath morning. So for those of you who might not know me, my name is Hannah, and I'm a part of the Young Professional Connect groups here at Kellyville. So just for a little background about me, um, I've grown up in the Hills area, and I've been um, grown up in the church, and I went on to study um, to be a registered nurse, and I've worked in critical care for the last few years while I did a little bit more study. Um, and I now work in tertiary education, um, teaching nursing students at Avondale University, and I absolutely love it. So just before we continue, I'm just going to start with a word of prayer. Hey God, thanks so much we can be here together today to worship you. Please open our hearts and our minds as we learn more about you. I ask your Holy Spirit to be present. May these words be yours and not my own. Amen. So I'm the type of person who very much needs to debrief when I get home from work or a social situation if, something that has, if something's challenged or upset me. Braden, my husband, who is also here, a teacher here at Hills, unfortunately cops the download of emotion and word vomit when I'm trying to process whatever has happened. Early in our marriage, I would come home after a really challenging shift in the hospital, sometimes in tears, and Braden would try to console me by offering a range of solutions to try and fix the situation or the issue that had happened. And most of the time, this is not actually what I wanted to hear, um, as it was really going on deaf ears, and I'd actually become more upset. Understandably so, Braden would become very frustrated that I didn't consider his advice as the practical and problem-solving person that he is. We have grown since then, and if I come home emotionally charged, needing to debrief, which is fortunately less often now, he starts the conversation with, do you want a solution or do you just want a hug? I'm sure that you've been in a similar situation when you have been really upset about something that has happened and the response of the person that you're confiding in is not helpful for you at the time and, in fact, sometimes makes it worse. In the story of Lazarus, Mary and Martha both come emotionally charged to Jesus after losing their brother. Jesus reveals again his compassionate and patient heart in this encounter with both of them. If you'd like to read on with me, John 11, verses 21 to 35. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died but I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the son of God, who is to come into this world. After she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here, she said, and he is asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who had been out with Mary in the house, comforting her, noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? He asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. So here are two sisters, the same situation, who say the exact same words to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But surprisingly, there are two different responses from Jesus. When Martha speaks, he almost argues with her. Her message is, you are too late. But Jesus replies, I am the resurrection and the life. With me, it is never too late. Her heart and her words demonstrate despair and helplessness. But Jesus is rebuking her doubt and giving her hope. 
Then Mary comes from the home and says the exact same thing to Jesus. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But this time, he has an opposite response. He doesn't argue with Mary. Instead of offering a solution, he stands alongside her in her grief, and the scripture says, Jesus wept. These responses by Jesus point not only to his profound relational wisdom, but to an even deeper truth about his character, his heart, his identity. These two responses reveal that Jesus is both truly God and man, despite his claim that he is the resurrection and the life, that he is God. He responds to Mary in this way because he is human as well. He is one with us. He feels the horrific power of death and the grief of love lost. So Jesus gives Martha the truth or a solution, and that is what she needed most at that moment. He puts, her ha- he puts his hands on her shoulder and says, listen to me, don't despair. I'm here, resurrection, life, that is what I am. Then with Mary, he doesn't offer a truth or a solution. He wept with her, and that is what she needed most in that moment. Because of his human identity, he is low enough to step into her sorrow with complete sincerity and integrity and just weep with her. Sometimes we need the truth from a loving friend to shake us and shake our shoulders and say, wake up, look around you. Other times we just need someone to weep with us. When we try to console our friends or family, we regularly don't have the insight to give people exactly what they need in that moment. But Jesus does. He is the perfect, wonderful counsellor and friend. It is this paradox that he is both God and human. He is the lion and the lamb. Despite his high claims, he is never arrogant. Despite being so approachable to the weakest and the broken, he is completely fearless before the corrupt and powerful. He demonstrates gentleness without weakness, strength without harshness, humility without the slightest lack of confidence. This is the heart and the essence of Jesus' character. Later in John 14, he claims to the disciples to not merely have the truth, but to be the truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life. The scripture states that the witnesses observe Jesus and say, see how he loved Lazarus. But really we must see how he loves us. He became human, mortal, vulnerable, killable, all out of love for us. As Jesus states, he is the resurrection and the life. Jesus boldly challenged Martha to trust that he was the source of eternal life. Jesus presented himself as a champion over death. Going back to the story at the woman of the well in John 4, 14, Jesus turns the conversation about water into a metaphor for himself. He says he is here to bring living water that can become the source of eternal life. Now John in this term, now in John, this term refers to a new quality of life, one that is infused with God's eternal love. And it is this life that we can actually begin now and last on into the future. Now, the Bible tells us that we need to commit our lives to God daily. We need to embrace Jesus as the resurrection and the life. Yes, this is easier said than done. But by starting your day with a posture of prayer and committing your day to God is so important. I've tried to be more intentional about this by starting um, my morning with a prayer before I get out of bed. It is never a big, elaborate prayer. Um, but I take the time to commit my everyday working life to God. And this has had such an overall impact on everything that I do, particularly my mindset, as I ask God to be present. It definitely helps me to have the fruits of the Spirit throughout the day. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. As Romans 12 verses 1 to 2 states, and this is from the Message Version, Take your everyday, ordinary life, your sleeping, your eating, your going to work and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing that you can do for Him. I think in this day and age, we just try to overcomplicate our day to day lives. We live in a such an information rich society that is accessible at a click of a button or maybe some doom scrolling. 
We live, um, we want to work harder, earn more, gym six days a week, and try some fad diet, or maybe a new product, because some influencer on a digital platform said so. Whilst there is a time and a place for these things, God encourage, and God encourages us to live life to the fullest, it should not overwhelm or overcomplicate our lives and our minds, that we lose sight of the simplicity and the meaning of the life that God calls us to embrace. To love God, commit ourselves daily to him, and to love others. It is so important to remember how God's plan prevails, how he gives us hope and wants us to live this abundant life because of his great sacrifice. Sometimes we forget God's goodness in, your, in our lives, and I know I'm guilty of that too. A few birthdays ago, my now mother-in-law gave me this little um, tin prayer box, and on the top it said, when your head starts to worry and your mind just can't rest, put your prayers down on paper and let God do the rest. So you would write a little worry or concern or a prayer down on this piece of paper, put it in the box and pray over it. Now, just over a year ago, I actually looked back in this little prayer box, and I saw how God had prevailed in every one of those situations. It is so easy to forget how much God has already blessed us. I know practically for me, I've started a note, a continuous note in my phone. Um, and whenever I have one of those God moments, I write it down. And I'd actually challenge you to do the same and be reminded about how God moves in every aspect of your life. I don't know about you, but I have a great sense of relief and peace when I remember that God is in control and whatever happens is in his plan. When my mind goes into overdrive and I start to worry, I always take heart in knowing that God will never put you through anything that he knows that you cannot handle. And Jesus knows exactly what you need in those times of despair. He will provide you with the strength to not only survive those challenging seasons in your life, but to thrive from them. The rising of Lazarus was one of the most famous incidents in history. It is also one of the most revealing, showing us who Jesus is and what he came to do on earth. It showed Jesus' unconditional love and compassion for each and every one of us. As we can see from the example of Martha and Mary, Jesus wants us, Jesus wants to meet us where we are at and give us exactly what we need. We just need to commit our lives to him. Now, I want to leave you with a challenge. How can you embrace Jesus as the resurrection and the life daily? How can you reveal Jesus' character to those around you? Jesus offers us this abundant and eternal life to all those who believe in him. Let us share the news of this amazing gift we have through Jesus' ultimate sacrifice. Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you that you are a loving God who sent your only son, Jesus, so that we may have an abundant and eternal life. We are sorry for all the times we get overwhelmed and distracted by our day-to-day -day lives. Please help us to remember that Jesus is the resurrection and the life. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Kiara, Hannah and Hannah. Those messages are just what I needed today. And I hope that something in their messages blessed you today as well. Please stand as we sing this song. i
Um, yeah, wasn't that something, church? Um, I feel very blessed to say that I'm a part of the youth and that I'm a part of, I was a part of this service that just happened. I'd just like to shout out Kiara. If you didn't know, she's just in year nine. That kind of wisdom and that kind of intel- that knowledge for God at year nine is crazy. I know when I was in year nine, I wasn't like that. I just like to, I've, I feel proud that as a church, this is the kind of youth that we're developing in this church. Yeah, so um, we're down. <laughs> So yeah, uh, we'll just go through the um, announcements for today. So, Okay. So firstly, to learn more from today's service, we have our connect groups. But before that, we have our half an hour of refreshments. If you're a visitor, you can go to the table and I'll get you situated and you get a fast pass to the line for the coffee and stuff. Oh yeah, so um, on November 15th, we have our health seminar. You can check the flyers on the chairs. We have a lot around, sitting around for more details. And then... On December 3rd, we have the Christmas markets from 5 to 9 p.m. And you don't want to miss it. There's markets, there's jumping castles, there's petting zoos, and possibly more. You can check the what's on for more information. And with that, we've come to the end of our youth service. And just from the whole Kellyville youth, we, we would like to thank you all for listen, being here and participating with us.